Our Father and our God, we are grateful and thankful today for your power, for your majesty, for your goodness and mercies towards us. On this Palm Sunday, we are grateful that you are still making triumphant entries into our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our spirits, and our lives. And so, blessed God and eternal Redeemer, do now, God, what you've done so many times before. Send the power of your Holy Spirit and the sweet nectar of your blessed anointing. Hear our cry, blessed Lord, and as we hasten ourselves before your presence, ever so careful to render unto you all the glory, the praise, and the honor that you are due alone. To that God whose name is too sacred to be spoken by mortal tongue, but eternally adored, we declare, amen. To the beloved of God, I want to thank our minister of music, to Sister Ruby Man Poole, uh, for her ministry of music and for her help uh, and support during these difficult times and also to Brother Larry Brown, to our drummer and to the people of God who join us uh, via Facebook and through whatever venues for this is the day that the Lord have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We are certainly living in a, a difficult time difficult times which have become the new normal but what we are certain of is that God is up to something amongst the people of God and so we stand in strength and we stand in the favor of the divine knowing that this too shall pass and at its end we will be stronger wiser and so much better on this Palm Sunday Join me in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 19. Beginning our reading at verse number 41 and concluding our reading at verse number 44. It is traditional on Palm Sunday that we look at the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. This text still uh, is a part of their triumphant entry. But I think that in verse 41 through 44, it causes and calls us to look at a different segment of what God, through the Christ, says to us on today. In Luke chapter 19 and verse number 41, the word of God reads as thus. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Blessed be the word of God. I, I, I want to, uh, as we peruse this pericope, I, I want to talk about when God cries out. When God cries out. It seems ever so strange that we are one Sunday away from Easter. Just a couple of days away, we stand on Palm Sunday morning. 
we're looking towards normally, or we would look towards normally, uh, crowds of people filled up in churches, persons who never enter into the church any other time, but on Sundays like Palm Sunday and on Easter, they come in. And normally they are traditional messages in which we preach and teach. On this Sunday, we talk more about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, where he sends one and tells them to go find the donkey, go, go find that beast, and, and tell them that the Lord has need of you. And there, Jesus on the colt comes riding into Jerusalem. And there, they're waving their hands and palms laid upon the ground having been prophesied by the ancient prophets of old and declaring Hosanna. There are many different faces in the crowd, some crying Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Lord, raising him up in grand admonishment and adoration. Some of those same faces that would have met him or will meet him at the foot of the cross declaring crucify him. But I think that it calls us and causes us to take just a little bit more examination into the text. This place called Jerusalem, that ancient city. Jerusalem meaning city of peace. But now and oft times even within the pages of first century Palestine and the antiquitous pages of the biblical writ, we find that oft times there was not a whole lot of peace going on in the city. It had been prophesied in the First Testament uh, of, of the great travail of Jerusalem. Much prophecy had gone on and had been declared of one day that all people coming back from four sides, four ends of the world, or four ends of the earth coming back to Jerusalem. But Jerusalem testifies of a place just like our nation and our world testifies now in need of redemption, in need of a savior. Jesus coming in in this triumphant entry into the city, it's not simply a celebration. It's not just simply a testament and a testimony that the Messiah is not just a testimony and a testament that the Christ, the anointed one, is coming. It is a testimony and a testament that the one whom is coming is coming because there stands a people in need of a savior. That is the reality of all of the biblical writ, beloved of God. The biblical writ is a testimony, yes, it is a testimony in the first uh, testament of an ethnic minority and their struggle with their God in an effort to perpetuate their identity, but it's a people looking and waiting for a savior called the Messiah. They stand in the need of help. Yes, the New Testament is a testimony and a testament of a people who are outside uh, of that of, of the Hebrew, Hebraic uh, culture. Some who are Gentiles, who do not know the yeshiva, who do not know the synagogue, but they do know trial and tribulation. They do know pain and they do know ills and they do know tears and they too stand in the need of a savior. It is a testimony of a people in crisis who have come to discover that whatever we are and whatever we shall be, we within our simple humanity, there are some things that we just cannot face and defeat. We cannot control. We cannot contain utilizing just our simple hands and our simple intellect. So Jesus' entrance into the city is, is not just this glorious moment where everybody stands upon a high peak waiting to see the Messiah come, but this moment is not ever so triumphant, truly. It really is bitter. This moment is one in which the more that I read, it too causes my very heart to pain because oftentimes we think of what it feels like for us 
our own selves, our own family, our own wives and husbands and children to weep. We know what it is to lay in the bed and to wander and to worry. We know what it is to stand in front of caskets and to stare down at loved ones as they have transcended from time to eternity. We know what it is to grieve and to pain. We know what it is to weep and we know what it is to cry out. But have you ever thought, have you ever thought one moment, what does it feel like to be the sovereign of the universe? Have you ever thought about what it feels like to be the one that out from their, their very spoken word, universes and worlds came into existence? Have you ever thought about what it feels like that out of your word, breath, caused dust to come to, together and out of dust human life was formed into existence. Have you ever thought about what it would feel like to be all-knowing, to be omnipresent, to be all-seeing, to be above all, to be infinite, to be limitless, and the universal creator weeps and to cry? Have you ever thought about what it must feel like when we make heaven cry? Have you ever thought what it must feel like when God begins to shed bitter tears? Have you ever thought about what it must feel like for the one whom heals all pain to no pain? For the one whom controls all illness and wipes away all tears and, and calms all fears to begin to cry? Well, this text is a testimony of just that. Jesus, God wrapped up in human flesh, does not just come riding into Jerusalem, going towards a celebration of those crying out Hosanna, but King Jesus comes and views Jerusalem, the city of peace, and the Bible says that he weeps. God himself is crying out. He is not crying out because this is Palm Sunday. He's not crying out because he knows that in a few days, the same that are in the crowd, that cry Hosanna and give moments of praise and adoration will take him upon two intersecting twigs and, and pierce him in his hands and in his side and cause blood to spin down. But no, he is not crying for himself. He is crying for his people. And I need to tell you, that helps me right now. That an ought to help you, my beloved brothers and sisters of the eternal God, because God is not crying for God's self. God is crying out for God's people. That's the same relationship between a mother and a child. It does not mean that the mother has to be ill or the mother has to get in trouble, but when a good mama sees her baby, sees her baby in pain, sees her baby in anguish, the pain of the child is felt by the mother. And that is what Christ is for us. Christ is not just a God who sits up on a throne, who sits up high and looks down low, but Christ is a God that is intimate with our condition. It is a terminology utilized in theology called deism. And I thank God every day that I do not serve a deistic God. A deistic God is a watchtower God, a God who just sits and looks, has created, but just looks. You weep, but God just looks. You get in trouble and in crisis, but God just looks. Your mama and your daddy die, and you're hurting and your world is breaking down, but God just looks. You don't know how to go and where to go and where to turn. COVID-19 has caused frenzy and, and, and those of us to grow frantic, but God just looks. Children are going crazy. Families going insane. Economic trouble all around, but God just looks. 
But thanks be to God, we don't serve a deistic God. We serve a God of ethical monotheism. And that is a God who is not just looking, but that is a God who is interwoven and intertwined and intervening within our condition. God ain't just weeping and looking at us. God is not just concerned about us, but God is moving amidst us. See, God comes into Jerusalem and through that of Christ Jesus, and he looks and he weeps. But here's the question. Why does God weep? Why does Christ weep for them? Because they have been waiting for centuries for somebody to come and heal their land. We talked about it. It's a testimony and a testament. It's one of our pivotal scriptures during this season. Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal the land. I need to tell you, lands have been needed to be healed for a long time. This ain't the first time that crisis has befallen us. Some of us might not have seen crisis like this on our shores during our generation, during our season. But we have seen crisis. There has stood the need for healing. And so it was Jerusalem. They've been waiting for a savior and a messiah to come. But you know what the sad thing about it, beloved? Oftentimes, what we're we looking for is right in our midst and in our face the whole time. And we don't even recognize it. Jesus was walking through Judea and Galilee. Jesus was there healing the sick and raising the dead. He was turning water into wine. He was calling Lazarus there out of tombs. He was calling Jairus' daughters back from the clutches of death. He was causing the blinded eyes to see and causing deaf ears to hear. But Jesus was walking in the midst, but because the gift didn't look like they thought it ought to look. They didn't recognize Jesus was there to help them the whole time, but they were looking elsewhere for a deliverer. I need to tell you, beloved, be cautious and be careful about those in whom you connect to thinking that your salvation comes through them or even do not become guilty of idolatry and you think that you are your own salvation. Look at us now. Look at the nation, look at the world, look at us with all of our intellectual ability, with all of our provocativeness, with all of our scientific knowledge, with all of our technological advances. First, it was only through droplets. If somebody did not sneeze on you or you didn't touch what somebody had coughed on, you were saved. Gloves and masks could save you, but now it's airborne. You can step outside on your own porch and if you choose not to suffocate to death and inhale, you could grow sick. Sometimes you stand in a situation and God places us strategically in a situation where there's nothing in your own will and power that you can do to save yourself. But I need to tell you, the salvation was present for our God is an omnipresent God. God is present in our circumstances, in our situations, in our lives at all times. But sometimes and sadly, we are going to seek the spirit, not conscious and aware that the spirit was already here. I heard someone just yesterday talking about the state of the church of God in Christ. Somebody had said or uh, prophesied that, 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 that many or uh, uh, most of the general board was needed to die in order for there to be a transfiguration or transformation in the church. And, and interestingly, many of the general board members are sick. One has passed. Another is on life support in ICU. But, 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 but here is the thing. They, they, he went on to say that there's no Ames convention. There's no national convocation and said, We've been going somewhere to church to feel the spirit, not recognizing that the spirit was already present. 
And I need to tell you that was the state of Jerusalem. They were looking for a Messiah. They were looking for a political Messiah to rescue them and to deliver them and to bring them out. And God sent a savior. But the savior came on the backside of a barnyard, wrapped up in swaddling and clothes in a manger, born to a mama and a daddy who had yet not even entered into the bounds of holy matrimony. Look at this Jesus, having come unto his own, but his own would receive him not. Look at this Jesus, poor, economically depressed. Look at this Jesus, no more than a carpenter. Look at this Jesus, rejected and dejected by his own. Look at this Jesus, look at this Jesus there at 12 in Jerusalem. Some marveled, others doubted. Look at this Jesus, a mysterious past from 18 to 30. Look at this Jesus calling men together to be a part of his ministerial staff and they come from strange places, strange circumstances lowly means but he came to save and transform the world the miracle was present but they didn't recognize it and so look at Jesus, Jesus looks at the city and Jesus weeps and I think that's what God is doing right now He's looking at us in our pandemic and Jesus is weeping. He's crying because he's saying, I was there all the time, but you didn't recognize that I loved you. I was there before the economic down crash and I made sure that you never went hungry. I was there at your marriage and I kept you even through a divorce, but you never took the time to lift up your hands and to tell me thank you. I was there through your chemo and through your radiation, but you never took the time to realize that it was not chemo, it was not radiation, it was my tender hand of mercy that ensured that through the sickness you could be lifted and carried to a greater level. I was there all the time. All I wanted you to know is that it was I that laid you down in the night and raised you up in the morning, and you might not have everything that you wanted, but you got it everything that you needed and look at you now I was there all the time and look now you in circumstance that doctors may have tests but they have no cure look at you now there is no mass so strong that can keep you. Not enough ventilators to sustain you. I weep for you because I was right there in your midst and you didn't even recognize me I was not clothed like you wanted me to be clothed. I had no crown on my head. I had no satin or silk on my back, but you did not even recognize me. But I have good news. He says, now in the midst of the good news, there is some bad discourse. He said, because you did not recognize my visitation, the prophetic words of Daniel shall come to pass. You did not recognize that this day, your day, was upon you. He said, I'm going to cause your enemies to come upon you. And they're going to barricade you in. He said, not only is it going to crash and to crumble and bring destruction upon you, but you and your family and all your children. But there is good news there. Even though you didn't recognize me then, the fact that I can cry for you, the tears that I cry for you serve as the prelude, serve as the preface to the chapter. The tears that I cry for you, I cry because it didn't have to be this way. But because I can cry for you, it also gives testament and testimony of the fact that I'm still present. Even though you didn't recognize me, I never left you. Even though you didn't acknowledge me, I never left you. 
Although you didn't give me the glory that I deserved then, I never left you. And yeah, some destruction going to come. Some bills might go unpaid. Some might get sick. Some might even pass away. There might be many nights where you cannot find a comfortable position to sleep. There might be many days where you grow so fearful that you don't even want to open up the door. But the fact that I cry for you is also a testimony that I'm going to die for you. Because what you can't do for yourself, I'm always willing to do for you. Because although you didn't acknowledge me, I ain't never left the situation. Lo, I'll be with you always. Even until the ends of the world, tears and seasons and, and, and crisis may come, but I shall forever be the ever present God. That which I was, that which I am, and that which I shall ever be. Oh, I'm going to keep on crying out for you. I'm going to cry out. I'm going to cry out until I have to cry my own tears. I'm going to cry for you while I'm in Gethsemane. I'm a cry for you while I drink of a cup that is filled with the stuff of your own sin because you didn't acknowledge me when I was already keeping you. And I'm going to ask a question of myself. How many times must I be a fence all around you? How many times must I dry your tears away? How many times must I rescue you from trouble? How many times must I bring you out of tribulation? How many days must I bring you through lowly valleys? How many days must I bring you over high mountains for you to know that I love you? But since you don't recognize it, you're going to go through trouble, but I'm still not going to leave you. I'm going to cry, and I'm going to sweat, and I'm going to drink a bitter cup in Gethsemane. I'm going to walk a cobblestone street headed to Calvary. I'm going to stand in a prison having not been truly convicted by virtue of probable cause, but I'm going to give myself for you. I'm going to not only cry out for you, I'm going to cause the moon to cry bloody tears for you as well, and the sun cannot shine so that it can illuminate the bloody tears that I cry and that the moon cries for you. I'm going to go to the twig intersected for you. I'm going to preach in hell for you and I'm going to get up on Sunday morning for you. But I'm not only going to do that. I'm going to keep on walking and keep on watching. Crying out. Crying out. Not for myself but for you. I wish you would have known. I was there all the time. And that's good news, beloved of God. That's good news, greater Mount Zion, that God is crying out for people, saying that I wish you would have known and recognize my presence. And if you would have recognized my presence, what is would never have to be. But I got good news. I didn't leave you then, and I shall not leave you now. And I shall be with you now and forevermore. I'm praying with you today. God, I thank you. I thank you that you weep and cry out for us to transform, to transfigure, that a people might know that what is occurring and going on right now is because maybe we didn't acknowledge that you were there all the time. We might not have seen COVID-19 before, but we've seen crisis and calamity. But we're standing here today with a testimony that we're here, it was because you were there even then. But thank you, blessed God. Thank you, holy Jesus. Thank you, lover of my soul. Thank you, keeper of our life, that even though you're crying out for the saints, you're still here in this moment. That though some things might have to come, some enemies might surround us, some things might fall, I thank you that we still have the certainty of a destiny in you. And so, Lord, I'm breathing and speaking life today over every household, 
over every man and woman, over every child, over every boy and every girl, to let them know God is crying out. But the tears of Jesus are tears shared for you. That your pain won't have to be so hard. That your grief not so long. And so is it is that I'm so glad that trouble won't last always. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Somebody today, wherever you are, you might not be saved. But even if you're in your house driving in your car, I want you to know that Jesus weeps for your salvation. Your salvation is secure in him. And maybe where you are sitting in your living room, driving in your car just today, tell God, I know that you're here. I know that you're present. I acknowledge you and come into my heart. And I need to say to you today, you're saved where you are. And maybe you're just in a difficult situation. Maybe you're just in fear. Maybe you're just so scared because you don't know what the next moment is going to bring. I got good news for you today. Just ask the Savior to help you. Come for strength and keep you. I need to tell you, Jesus is willing and able. He'll carry you through. Today is the first Sunday in the month of April. It is the Sunday in which we usually recognize the observance of Holy Communion, the sacrifice of Jesus, the gift of God through that of the cross and Christ. And so although we are absent in body, but present in spirit, many of our members took the time to come by and pick up their communion packets. And so today I want to take the time before we close this worship experience, this virtual worship experience, I want to take the time to remember the cross and to remember the blood of Jesus. For I don't know about you, but I know it was the blood that saved me. One day when I was lost, he died on the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. It was on that day in which our Lord was betrayed. He sat with his disciples. He looked towards that moment, reminding them that I won't be with you always, but what I'm going to do in this moment shall be forever. And so there he shared with them bread and he shared with them the cup of blood a wine representing his blood. Blood, the cup, the sign of the New Testament, and the bread representation of his body. At that moment, he said to them, he said, one of you are going to betray me. Jesus was weeping and crying out for us. And there Judas was scared in that moment as the disciples said, Lord, is it I? He said, the one who has cast his hand into the dish with that of my own is the one who shall betray me. He said, it's better that you would have never have been born than to have betrayed the Son of Man. But there, the bread, reflective of his body, he took it, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he said, take, eat ye all of it. Likewise, in the left, the wine, the fruit of the vine closest to the heart, the symbol of the New Testament. He blessed it, he gave thanks. For without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. He said, take and drink ye all of it. They collected all of the fragments that nothing would be lost. They then stood up in a rose and they went out to the Mount of Olives and they sung a song. And so, beloved of God, I want you to remember that as we close today, that one day when you, when me, when I, when all of us were lost, King Jesus died upon the cross. 
And I know it was the blood that saved me. And you know the blood that saved us is still saving us right now. And so do remember, beloved of God, to continue to sow into the ministry of Greater Mount Zion. Those who may not be members, you still have the opportunity to sow into this ministry during this time of reflection and renewal, responsibility and resp responsiveness. I know that when it's all said and done, we're going to be so much better, so much greater, and so much stronger. You can go to our Givelify or our e-giving, or you can mail your gifts. Whatever is in you to do, just know that God has something great for you. God is still crying out, but he's crying out for a people that he has you in your plan. Now, here is this one little final word that I have to say to you. It is the prayer of Jude in which I always declare, now unto the God who is able to keep us from falling, present us faultless before God's divine presence with exceeding joy. I searched all over to try to find another God like this one, and I never was able to find. So unto this God be the glory, unto this God be the majesty, the dominion, the honor, and the power. And if anybody ever asks you, how long will God be God? Now henceforth and forevermore. And we say, amen. And we'll see you the same time, the same place next week. God bless you.